welcome everybody to this talk on the six WordPress best practices to ensure project success. And I really probably should have worded that as six best practices to ensure WordPress project success because these are actually project management best practices that I have modified and tweaked to be specifically for WordPress. So, if you are a solution, a WordPress solution provider, then that's what this training is mostly for. If what you are primarily is a builder of websites, then this training might not be quite as applicable to you because I'm focusing more on people who focus on solving business problems with a WordPress website instead of just, I'm going to build the website as part of that whole effort. Um, so figure out which one you are. <laughs> um, and so what you're going to learn today is six productivity principles for WordPress project success and where they came from. They actually came from Boston, believe it or not. Um, and uh, the six best practices that stem from those principles and how those best practices can actually increase your project success. Um, now we have to do the obligatory about me part. Uh, this always makes me a little uncomfortable because uh, I'm, you know, you're talking about yourself and talking about your credentials and it sounds like you're being talk really braggy and everything. So I'm going to go over this part really quickly. Uh, my name is Beth Livingston. I am a WordPress solution provider. Um, I live in Greensboro, North Carolina in a little old neighborhood that was recently named the nicest place in North Carolina, primarily because at Christmas time we have this thing where they do these great big Christmas balls that people put way up in their trees with a potato gun. They throw, put the wires way up there. If you might not know what a potato gun is, look it up. It's southern. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, so in the so that photo with the hats, that's me and my daughter on her 21st birthday. We were all just pretending she had never had a beer. Um, and she's up and gone now. So those are my other empty nest fillers. That's Rudy and Nick. They were both Christmas dogs, Rudolph and Nicholas. So. Um, <laughs> I started out life as an early childhood education major and I taught in the first grade. Then uh, it was a time in life when there just was a glut of school teachers where I was, so I went back to school and got a degree in instructional design. After that, I became a training specialist for a software development company based in North Carolina, transportation, actually trucking. Then I moved into the technical writing area. Later, I got even more technical and moved in, into the role of an IT business analyst and a project manager in corporate IT, primarily in the financial industry. I've worked and managed projects at American Express, GMAC Insurance, Wachovia Bank, which is now Wells Fargo, and The Clearinghouse, which is where your financial transactions clear. It's owned by all the major banks. Um, here's what, um, the only thing I have to say about that. I get a credit union. Okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Now I am, as I said, a WordPress solution provider. And I started going to WordCamps. What I was doing was uh, I wanted to teach uh, small business owners how to manage their own website, give them the skills they needed to do that. So that's why I called it Roadmaps, right? Well, I found out that most small businesses don't want to manage their own websites. And also, I started going to WordCamps. And I started hearing all of you, other WordPress solution providers, complaining about the same things. Scope creep, getting content from the client, getting the projects done on time and within budget. And I know how to do that because of the time I spent as a consultant, a principal consultant with Keen. Who here is from Boston? You ever heard of this company? Oh, yeah. They were at one city square for many years in the 80s and the 90s. And um, pardon me, I get dry mouth when I talk about myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were um, always in the Gardner Magic Quadrant for getting projects done on time and within budget. And primarily the reason behind that is because of these productivity management principles. And I don't know where to put this. Oh, here we go. My go daddy, Lord Bob. Um, when you went to work for Keene, you had to attend a two day seminar. First of all, you got that book on the first day. John Keene wrote that book. He created these six principles. Um, like He was an old at IBM or formed his own consulting firm. His projects were always coming in over time and budget, so he did what any good IBM would do hire a consultant. And he got that consultant, and the, so the consultant figured out what was going wrong, and then John uh, created these principles for us to follow, and it really was almost like a cult. If you didn't attend that two-day seminar, if, even if you were a senior manager, 
you're gone because it was that important. Um, and, and why? Because these principles, they just work. Um, they're based on the premise that a plan is just a plan. You know, a lot of times we're afraid to put stuff in the project plan because we think that it's carved in granite, but it's not. A plan is fluid. It's supposed to be fluid. It's more like a GPS, you know, where you run into a roadblock and then you get redirected into another, another um, avenue or whatever. It's also heavily, heavily focused on planning. And that's why I love this quote from Abraham Lincoln. I was actually born on Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Had I been a boy, my name would have been Abraham Lincoln Lyles. Very thankful I'm a girl. Um, my grandfather's name was Benjamin Franklin Lyles. My mother was kind of weird like that. So she wanted to carry on that tradition. But give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I'll spend the first four sharpening the axe. Because if you spend enough time sharpening the axe, cutting down the tree is, eh, it doesn't take that long. All right, so here are John Keane's six, oh, I wanted to mention about John Keane. I, I credit him with, how many people in here know Agile development? Do you know what that is? Okay, I credit John Keane with creating the sprint because he used to give us an 80-hour rule. We had to have a deliverable every 80 hours. That might be a little overkill for WordPress, okay? But we, it wasn't necessarily a client deliverable, but by having a deliverable every 80 hours, you knew right where you were in the timeline within two weeks at any given moment. It was brilliant. He was a brilliant man. His sons, not so much. Um, well, they're, they're kind of the reason the company, but that's a story for a cocktail party. <laughs> All right. Um, so these six principles on the left are John Keane's principles, and the ones on the right are how I've tweaked it for WordPress. So define the job in detail with a content-first approach. And we're going to go a little bit more into some of these um, based on the six best practices that have come out of these principles. Get the right resources involved. He had to get the right people. It's more than people. Estimate time and cost. You need to do it more than once. Um, break the job down. That's pretty much break the job down. There's no way to change that. Um, you know, everybody's got a change procedure. The big deal is sticking to your own change procedure. Um, and then establish interim and final acceptance criteria. So stay to the end because that's really one of the best ones, okay? Um, all right, so what is Pro WordPress project success? This is my definition. Yours might be different, um, but I imagine it's very similar. So little to no scope creep. You get completed on time, within or under budget. You get paid for all the work you do, including the deep dive discovery. You retain your planned profit margin. The client is happy and satisfied. And the end, pro this is a big one, the end product actually does meet the client's business requirements. I don't care if it looks like they want it to look. If it meets their business requirements, you've done your job. So to me, this is project success. And when you meet project success on a project, this is what you get to do. <laughs> right, you feel like the Charlie Brown happy dance, right? Okay, so let's talk about these best practices. The first one is make the customer part of the project team. And this is based on the principle, get the right resources involved. But what if the right resources aren't available when you need them? Then you need to get your resources involved rightly. And by that I mean, let's say your client will not change hosting companies and you really like this other host a whole lot better. You gotta work with the one you got, right? So it's just the way it is. So sometimes it means switching things around. Okay, so here's the thing. Almost all the time, WordPress web practitioners or solution providers, you know, I can never know whether to call myself a designer, or a developer, or an implementer, or an integrator, so I've chosen a solution provider. Before that, I was using practitioner, but I think solution provider is more accurate. So when we always sit, tend to set ourselves as the worker bee and that the client is the boss, and that's not the way it should be. It should be that you are colleagues, that you're not the hired hand. You need to work... Uh, Give the client the idea that you're working on this project together. You're just as good as they are, but you have your subject matter expertise in a different area than they do. Now, you might be thinking that, well, you know, whoops, hold on. Uh, I'm using the presenter mode here, so I need to scroll down so I can see the rest of my notes there. Um, oh, you need to make sure that they understand they're not handing this off to you so that you, and then they swoop in to do approvals and rejections, that you're working on this together. And it's really important, and this all boils down to setting the proper client expectation. And so when you, when you make it clear to them that we're all part of a team, and you show them a picture like this and say, okay, what happens when that guy in the middle stops rowing? 
Nobody else can row either, right? So if you, Mr. Client, don't get your assignments done, that's what's going to happen. This project is going to stop. Um, you need to be brutally honest with them about the things that often go wrong and how the clients cause that, and then tell them we're not going to let that happen on this project. Not, we're not going to let this happen on that project, but us together, we're going to work together. I've got some processes in place, and I know you're not that kind of person, so you know, you set that proper client expectation that way. You need to become the guide. Okay, whatever you think your client knows, subtract 75% from that. Because you know what? We live in this world every day. And I hear, I hear practitioners or solution providers talking all the time about how stupid their client is, or the client doesn't know this, and the client doesn't know that. If the client doesn't understand your processes, that's your fault, not theirs. You need to explain to them what these processes are, why they're in place, and they're there, they're designed to prevent all these problems that we're all going to have later if we don't follow the processes. Am I talking too loud? I get kind of passionate. And I'm also a theater person, so I talk really loud. So. Um, if I get too loud, just let me know. Okay. Oh, walk them through your processes. Oh, and most importantly, get their input on their project dates. Or just the whole project schedule. Make them think they're helping you devise that schedule. Um, when you work shoulder to shoulder with the client, it really does help. Okay, how many people have trouble getting contact from the client on time? Give them an incentive. Add some money to the project, quote, so that you can offer a discount and not give up any of your profit for getting your dates met. If money is not the motivator for your client, although I don't know who, <laughs> there are very few clients where money's not the motivator, but if that's not the motivator, then offer some additional services. Hey, if you get your stuff done on time, then, you know, we'll reward you with a cupcake or a carrot. Um, oh, let me make it very clear, this is not padding the quote. This is not adding money for some arbitrary, might happen kind of thing. This is, I'm going to add this money, and that way I can offer a discount if they do what they need to do. Um, oh, and then you also need to build in penalties for not getting it done on time. And this is what most of my clients do, my clients that are now, that I'm now helping with project management and stuff. Um, you know, that's, um, uh, sorry, totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> Um, the penalties, yes. Uh, a lot of clients will say, "All right, if you don't get you, if you don't meet your date, project goes on hold." I go on to work on other stuff. I'm gonna take on new clients. If you don't get your stuff done, and when you're ready, I might be ready. I might not be ready. But we do a change request and change, you know, and put those everything on hold. Um, it works like crazy good when you do it that way. You know, we try to be so nice, but if we lay these things out in the in the beginning. And you say, this is how I do business, and then if they balk at it at the beginning, go on to the next client, you won't have to be working with those clients that are difficult to work with. I don't do it anymore. All right, um, develop a client management plan. These are the three, I'm talking fast because I had to cut out slides to get all this in. I have so much to tell you. Um, uh, what type of clients do you want to work with? Write that down. And then how are you going to manage those client activities? You know, so many times we say, okay, Mr. Client, here are, your, here are your tasks, go off and do that, and I'm going to go do the rest of the project. And you need to manage their stuff as well as your own. And then what incentives are you going to offer? So the, the, the way that this um, best practice contributes to project success is it increases client understanding of their role. You end up with much, many fewer project delays and associated costs caused by the client. The second best practice is to use a two-step proposal process. And it's based on the principle, define the job in detail with the content first approach, and break the job down. So the first thing you need to stop doing here is stop giving away your solution in the proposal. Uh, I'm going to tell you something really funny here in a second. But when you do that, you're basically giving your client the ability to go take your solution and get somebody else to bid on it. And you, and you don't want to put that much work into something you may, and they may end up getting rejected anyway. I hear that one all the time. I, I spent hours and hours and hours on this beautiful proposal, and I know I nailed it. Crickets. I hear crickets from my client. And so I don't believe in ever leaving a proposal with a client anyway, but you just don't put all the detail. They don't read it anyway. I have a friend that shared with me, how many people use better proposals? Anybody? Okay, Better Proposals is an online tool where you can load your proposal up 
give a link to your client, and then you can track where they spend their time. You can see how much time they're spending on each section of the proposal. Again, I'm not in favor of letting clients go through things like that on their own, but a friend of mine on Facebook shared his with me. They spent tons of time on the cost part, which you would expect, a little bit of time on the timeline. You know how much time they spent on the solution? Zero. Zero. I was shocked. Zero, to, and they, he got the, the, the job. But they don't care about the technical stuff of the solution. They don't care about the plugins. And at this point, they really don't even care about the design. What they care about is how long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost. That's basically all they care about. So stop giving away your solution. And this is one of my pet peeves. Stop giving quotes. Stop calling it a quote. It's not a quote. The fence builder that comes to your house, that's a quote. Your yard is not going to change size. The materials are going to cost the same this week as they did last week most of the time. He knows exactly how long it's going to take him. That's a quote. We give estimates because we don't know what, I mean, you, you, if you have an hour and a half pre-proposal meeting with the client, you can't know everything you have to know at that point. Am I right? So, you cannot estimate what you do not know. That is like giving the crystal ball approach to estimate. And I am totally against the crystal ball approach to estimating. <laughs> we'll get to a little bit more about estimating. So what are you doing in, instead? You position phase one as the deep dive discovery and add that into the quote. And we're going to get into a little more detail about that here in just one second. This is my two-step proposal process. You may choose to do yours differently, but this is what works for me. Now open up your minds because there's a radical process in here that I want to explain to you. Okay, I start with, with phase zero because I don't really consider it a project until it has been accepted. And so we, I have a questionnaire. Sometimes I walk the client through the questionnaire. Sometimes I leave it with them. Depending on how much they know about what they want is, and how savvy they are. Then I estimate the content first and the other activities in my work breakdown structure. Um, and then I provide that initial estimate as a range. So if the client's okay with anything within that range, and if it does not get approved, that's the end of that, but I haven't put a whole lot of work into it, so I haven't lost hours and time and money. But if it is approved, then I get a deposit to cover that whole first phase, at least, sometimes more. And sometimes that's more than 50%. And so then if we, um, so then we go on to phase one, if, it's, um, if we get the deposit, it's accepted. This, and phase one is step two of the process where we perform the deep dive discovery. Then, while we're doing that deep dive, anything that I discover that was not considered in the proposal, I add that to a list. Now, we haven't drawn a line in the sand yet to say that everything's settled, so we don't have to do change, for change control yet. We're just keeping a list of all these things that weren't considered in our first estimate. Then we adjust for any new requirements. We adjust our initial estimate using our work breakdown structure for any changed requirements. And I create what I call a detailed statement of work. That's really just the whole website spec. But it has a more precise estimate. Now notice I'm not using the word accurate estimate because there is no such thing. I'm using a more precise estimate. And if that precise estimate exceeds, does not exceed what was in the proposal, we're good to go because the client's already approved that. So we just move on to phase two. But if it does, because we found all this new stuff, that, or they made, they thought of things they decided they wanted now, then I give the, the client the option to cancel. Now this is because they've been shoulder to shoulder with me as we developed that, all of that spec. I break things down into small pieces, so they've looked at everything. They know exactly where these requirements are coming from. They hardly ever cancel at this point. So if they don't cancel, we just go on to phase two. If they do cancel, I hand over the statement of work and I wave bye-bye because they're not my client, right? If they're, if they're having trouble over stuff that we found, so it's going to cost more, then they're not somebody I want to work with anyway. Um, but the, the beauty part of this is they got what they paid for. They're happy. They can take that off to Fiverr or wherever they want to try to get it done. And I'm happy because I got paid for it. And I'll just move on to the next client. Does that make sense? Okay. So the way that this best practice creates project success is it stops you from giving away your solution. You get paid for that deep dive discovery. It controls scope creep. And it has that extra advantage of letting you offload clients that might not be a good fit. 
All right, best practice number three, use a repeatable, measurable estimating process. Um, so the main thing here is just like we just talked about, stop guessing and abandon the crystal ball approach. The only way to get better at estimating is to keep practicing it and doing it all the time. That's the only way to get better. I don't know how to describe it any other way. Now, um, if you abandon this crystal ball approach, then you can never answer that question at the cocktail party. Hey, Bob, how much do you charge to build a website? Well, your, your answer should always be, I don't know, until I know the business requirements of the client and what the website is supposed to accomplish in their, in their whole business um, you know, outlook or uh, approach. You need to develop a repeatable and, yes, a mathematical process for estimating that you can then take and improve over time. And here's what I mean. I start with a word breakdown structure. Um, and whether you estimate at the activity level or the task level is dependent on where you are in the process. When I do the proposal, I estimate at the activity level. When I do the, after the deep dive and I'm doing that final statement of work, I estimate at the task level. And if you've never done that, if you've never broken things down, if you're like more one of those people that offers packages and things like that, if you've never actually broken it down into every activity and task that you do, Yes, it's kind of tedious and boring, but if you do it, you'll be shocked at how many things you're not charging for that you probably should be charging for. So I, even if you never, ever plan to do this, just do it once because you'll see, man, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> estimate content first. Now, some people say, why do I need to estimate the content? The client's just going to go off and, and, do it and do that. Well, I try to talk my clients out of doing their own content because, number one, it's a bottleneck. Number two, they're terrible content writers, unless I'm doing something for somebody who that is their business. Um, so I create a rough order of magnitude estimate, and then I show it to the client. If you try to convince the client that they're not the best resource because they don't have the skill, well, that kind of offends them. I mean, they probably went to college. You know, they, I can write. I can take pictures. What's the big deal? Um, but when you show them how much time it's going to take, with a rough order of magnitude, that is the single best way to talk them out of, get, of doing that content themselves. Either let me do it, or let's get a third party to do it. And estimate often. As you drill down into that deep dive discovery, even if it's not an estimate that you're going to give to the client, you need to continue to re-estimate when you find new things. So that then you know how, much, how far off are we, even before you get to the end. And then, of course, anytime there's a change, when the change request is invoked, then you're definitely going to want to need to estimate again there. Always review your last estimate before doing the next estimate. This is another thing we forget to do. But this is how continuous improvement works. How are you going to get better if you don't look at what you did last time and figure out where the mistakes are? And maybe there weren't any, but that's even better. You know, I did it right. Let's do it that way again. Excuse me, I'm going to take a sweet. Okay, so most of you are probably familiar with this basic estimating process, but I'm going to go over it real quick here anyway. So you start with that work breakdown structure. You've broken it down into activities and tasks. Then you assign the resources. Maybe it's just you. Maybe it's you and the client. Maybe it's you, the client, and a third party. But you need to assign those activities and tasks to the specific resources because the time it takes may vary depending on who the resource is. Then you estimate the time it takes for each one of those, multiply it by each resource's hourly rate. And this is a part that a lot of people forget is in incidental time. That time you take to create a status report, have a status phone call with the client, have any kind of meeting with the client, anything that's related to managing the project but not the development of the actual thing needs to be added in as incidental time. And then you come up with your estimate. Now, th this is the basic process. It does change depending a little bit depending on where you are in the whole process. And then, of course, the biggest success factor here is you're just going to end up with more money the better you get at estimating. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about padding and that sort of thing in a minute. Okay, use a content-first development approach. Now, there's a lot of gurus out there. Uh, this is based on the principles break the job down and define the job in detail with a content-first approach. A lot of gurus out there will say, content-first design, content-first design. And I, I totally get that, and I, and I agree with it. But it's not just about content-first design. It's about content-first development. How much time do I have, Kathy? 
no, my wife's yelling at me. Uh, oh. got 15 minutes. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> I was just doing a time check because I, I, the first time I, I read this off to myself, it was like an hour and 15 minutes. I was like, yeah, I gotta do something. <laughs> so I'm just hoping that I'm in the. And I'm, I, like I said, I want to get all this out to you. Okay, so content first development. It's just more practical, y'all. Yes, it does help. It proves design because you're considering the content before you do the design, but it also, if you do it right, it speeds development, reduces scope creep, and it prevents that content collection bottleneck. So it improves design because if you consider the content, if you do all the design and then the content comes in and it's not in the form or they change things and then you've got to go back and change the design, that's just rework, 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 which is unadulterated scope creep. <laughs> Okay, so, um, and let me ask you a question. If you had all the pieces and parts, all the content, all the plugins are defined, all the configurations for the plugins are already planned, and all you're doing is putting all of that together, pulling it all off the shelf and putting it together, how long is it actually going to take you to build that website? Not very long with WordPress. I can build, I can build a five-page website in a few hours if I have everything, right? If I have already done the theme, i got everything spelled out. Just makes it makes development go so much faster. Reduces scope creep because if you use that two-step proposal process too, then you um, you haven't drawn the line in the sand until the statement of work is done, so you don't have to do the change request, and so it helps to control that because you found all those things early instead of later after you've got some things carved and granted. It prevents this content collection bottleneck. You know that's where you get 50% up front. And then you start the website and you say, okay, client, go off and do the content. And then it's ready, you're ready for the content, but they don't bring it. And then you do this. Hey, you know what? Let's just finish building the website. And then when they bring the content, then we'll be ready. How many of you have ever done that and never got paid? Never got, never finished it? The, yeah, there's at least one in every room, two, where they just disappear, right? And you never get, the other project never gets finished. You never get paid for that final leg. Don't do work that you, not, that you stand a chance, a risk of not getting paid for. So this no longer works. You need to restructure your payment schedule. Now this is how I do it. There are a number of other ways to do this. Some of my clients do it a little bit differently. But um, upon acceptance of the proposal, I get that deposit that covers me at least through phase one. And then um, upon acceptance of the statement of work, I get 50% of whatever's remaining. And then um, at the completion of testing, I get 50% of whatever's remaining. At completion of training, I get all the rest of the remaining funds. But notice there's no a thing on here about going live. Because I don't go live till I get those funds. I make sure that I develop it somewhere they can't shut me out. And I make sure that, I, that we get paid before we turn it over to live. But everything's been done, so it's just a flipping of a switch almost, just moving it over. And then this is how um, I structure the project plan. In phase zero, I estimate for the needed content. In phase one, I identify who's going to do those content activities and when they're going to be done. And then during design and preparation, I collect all the content. And then development and testing is almost like a no-brainer. And then deployment and training, and then we go live. And so that's how I do the content first approach. And like a, the project success factors are the same reasons, it, it's because it's practical. And it also aids in getting completed on time. Okay, use incremental acceptance. Now, this is one you might not have heard about. It, it also uses an upfront acceptance criteria approach. This is straight out of the head of John Keane. Um, break the job down, establish interim and final acceptance criteria are the principles that this one is based on. Now, let me tell you why I'm calling it acceptance instead of approval. If you set acceptance criteria up front, it becomes more like a checklist. Approval becomes a checklist. They might not approve of something they see on the website, but if it meets the criteria that you agreed upon at the beginning of the project, they have to accept it. And that's in your contract. They can't just make up a new requirement at the last minute and go, well, I know it has everything's on that list, but I really want that to be a different color blue. No, we don't do that. So that's the difference. Then I break deliverables into much smaller parts. Thank you. Um, there's Q&A after the 10 minutes. Or well, <coughs> um, I break my deliverables into small parts. And I do approvals on those small parts. And that's what I mean by incremental acceptance. 
Okay, I'm going to flip through these slides really quickly because I do have a download of these same things that you can get from my website, and I'll tell you where that is in just a second. Elements of a good acceptance management plan. You, and the, the, I put this in my proposal. Identifies all the deliverables that are going to be approved. It specifies that acceptance criteria for each deliverable and the final project at the beginning. Whoops, sorry, I had my finger on the button. Um, <coughs> Dang, I went way far. Okay. Specifies the acceptance criteria. Identifies who's responsible for reviewing and, and approving. Specifies the turnaround time. Clearly states what happens when the client, when he doesn't meet the turnaround time. This is not it. Okay. And defines rejection with cause. That's what I was talking about a minute ago. Now, if if. When they get ready to review the site, and one of the requirements was that the font needed to match the font on their written materials, and you forgot, and so the font doesn't match, it might even be close, but it's not exact, that's rejection with cause. They have every right to reject for that. They don't have any right to reject for something that's not on that criteria list. <coughs> and then it uses incremental acceptance, and I'll show you how this contributes to project success with this little animated slide. I start with a site map and I get that approved. That feeds into the content spec and I get that approved. That feeds into the functional spec, I get that approved. That feeds into the design, I get that approved. So when it comes time to do the full website spec approval or acceptance, it gets done in a fraction of the time, which means I get to hold on to more money. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the other project success factors is that the client gains a vested ownership up front because they've helped you define what those acceptance criteria are going to be. It increases team satisfaction, control scope creep, and streamlines final project acceptance. All right, best practice number six. We're down to the last one. Invoke your change control process without exception. Yes, I'm yelling at you with all capital letters. Without exception. <laughs> Red capital letters. Um, and that is based on the principle established and stick to a change procedure and break the job down. And I actually tweeted my own t quote the other day. Is that tacky? <laughs> I did it anyway. I thought it was a pretty cool one. Not actively managing inevitable change inevitably results in lost revenue. Y'all, change is going to happen. Quit acting like if I get it right, there won't be any change. That's crap. You're gonna, there's going to be change. So go ahead and accept it and position it with the client that, look, we know that change is going to happen. You might forget some things. I might forget some things. We might think of some good ideas later on. So we have to plan for and manage that change. All right, so here are the elements of a good change control procedure in the interest of time. I'm not going to read this slide to you. Like I said, there's a download later if you want to get it, and I'll tell you how to do that. Um, the biggest one here is invoking it without exception in number three, which is using a change budget, and that I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. And then defining change. You know, we kind of assume that everybody knows what that means, but you really do need to define what it means. And I actually have a download on my website of a sample change control process where you can take that and copy it if you want to. I'll give you those URLs in just a minute. Okay, uses a change budget. This is a big one. Now. Using a change budget means you don't have to pad the estimate. I'm doing a talk in Birmingham called The Pad is Bad. <laughs> because it is. The reason you don't want to use a pad is because you can't measure it. It's just an arbitrary amount of money that you stuck on the top of your project because you're too lazy to do an estimate. I mean, I'm just telling you, that's what it boils down to. And I might have got stuff right, I might not have got stuff right. But the way the change budget works is. Um, once you come up with the estimate without a pad, then you take a certain percentage. I usually use 20 to 30 percent, and I add that to the project. But it is set aside in a separate budget only for change. Um, so if you don't use it, you don't have any changes, you don't use it. Um, and beca but because you've planned for and budgeted for change, you don't have to use the pad. And this can actually become a selling point because trust me, everybody else in the universe is padding the estimate. So if you get your client, if you educate your client and say, look, I didn't pad the estimate, here's how we're going to do it. Hey, go ask the next guy if he's padding the estimate. Works. <laughs> okay, the other thing about the change budget is it really reduces those frivolous change requests. Somehow when it's invisible money, like 
um, they'll say, well, I want to change that color blue all the way across the website, like at the last minute. And you go, okay, well, that's, thank you. Um, uh, okay, well, that's going to cost you money. That is easier for them to do. But if you've already got the money set aside, and this is how much you can save off the top of your project if we don't have any changes, really cuts down on the frivolous change requests. They just won't ask for them as much. And here's the beauty part for you, is it means you always come in under budget. Because it is part of the budget. So if on the off chance, this hardly ever happens, but if you're a good estimator, but let's say that you have to add money to the change budget. Well, you do that with a change request, and the client knows why, because you came across something that you weren't expecting or whatever the reason is. So you can increase the change budget, so at the end of the day, you're always going to be under budget. Okay. Um, so, and it also virtually eliminates scope creep. So you can tell that I'm kind of fond of the Wahoo. <laughs> I have it all over myself. Um, this is, um, I, and I love James Tryon. He's created some of these characters himself, which just cracks me up. That one in the middle is actually called Scope Creep. And he's, got his, he's got these two heroes. So he's got hero Wapoos and he's got villain Wapoos. That's not the only villain Wapoo. So go to Wapoo.us and check out his work. It's really very clever. I mean, he does a lot of stuff, you know, for, for work camps and stuff, but he's got some clever stuff out there, too. Okay, I'm going to go over the uh, project success factor here for good change requests. I mean, a good... Um, uh, just the whole change process, sticking to it. So you do the change request. Is it approved? Let's assume it is. They take the money out of the change budget, put it in the regular budget, and you get paid. Okay? But what if they don't, they don't approve the change request? We put that into a phase two list. And you know what happens most of the time with a phase two list? They go back and look at it and go, oh, that's stupid. We don't want any of it. But if they do do the phase two, chances are they're going to use you, and you're going to get paid. <laughs> So that's why that's a real um, success factor, I mean, a, a contributor to the success of your project. So today we've covered six best practices for uh, project success, which is make the customer part of the project team, use a two-step proposal process, use a repeatable measurable estimating process, use a content-first development approach, use incremental acceptance, invoke your change control process without exception. Now, if you want to learn more, I have some free training on my website at wproadmaps.com. Um, right, the, the one about editing CSS is not really project management so much as it is productivity management because I found a tool that just saved me tons of time, so I did this video for some people. But then um, the project notebook uh, is helpful as well. I also have some downloadable templates. So if you go to wproadmaps forward slash templates, and that's where you can get the, the change control procedure. Okay. Um, coming later this year, I'm starting the WordPress Project Managers Academy, and that will be a free membership site to learn more about managing WordPress projects more effectively. And then, and oh, well, let's let me back up. So that one is at forward slash WPPMA, which is WordPress Project Management Managers Academy. I'm using WordPress as an adjective, not as a noun. Okay. Thank you. My name is Beth Livingston, and here's how you can contact me. <laughs> um, but my slides are available on my website at uh, in forward slash WordCamp. There's actually been a menu option. I talk at so many WordCamp. Um, these are my, twi my Twitter handles and everything. Please give me some social media love if you liked this talk. Um, I'll be at the after party if you want to talk some more. And um, I'm a theater person, so... <laughs> Did you learn some stuff? Okay, does anybody have any questions?